A sight you can sometimes see up some hill burn in the Tweed catchment is a brood of gassanders taking flight. Now, with full crops and stomachs, they will often regurgitate what they've been eating. And in one case, this was collected up. And this is a sample of some of the 110 salmon fry in par regurgitated by just seven gusanders on the Kingle Doodles burn uh, some years ago. But we all haven't always had gusanders in spring and summer. In the past, they were wintering birds, uh, just on rivers and on the coast as well. And you can see from this clipping from the Berkshire Naturalist Club that back in the 1870s, there was a sort of rare bird that Victorians liked to shoot and stuff. But we don't have any records of actual breeding in the Tweed area until the 1930s when the Upper Ettrick started to have a few broods. But the question, of course, is whether gusander predation could actually be of a scale to affect the numbers of adult fish returning back to the river, and therefore, of course, the chances of anglers catching. According to the BTO's website, it takes 33 kilos of fish to rear a gusander up to adulthood, and as a salmon smolt weighs about 28 grams, 33 kilos would be the equivalent of 1,100 or so smolts. So with an average cut size of 8 to 11 eggs, it would take an equivalent weight of fish to 10,500 smolts to rear a clutch to adulthood. With fry and par, however, you have a thing called compensatory survival, which is illustrated here. Now those three big fry up there are all fat and well conditioned, and they're obviously holding territories and thriving, and have a good chance of survival. The little starving fish at the bottom obviously doesn't have a territory. It will be lurking around in the margins of the stream, picking up what food it can, and will probably starve to death. However, if one of those big fat fry gets eaten by a gusander, there becomes a vacant territory that such a little fish could move into, and that would compensate for the predation. However, there is no compensatory survival for smolts. A smolt is the end product of the freshwater phase. It doesn't have a territory anymore. It's moving down the river on its way to the sea. So if it does get eaten, there's nothing to replace it. There's no sort of half smolt that can suddenly take over uh, from it. So following up this idea of whether gusander predation could be of such a scale, we can look at the ettrick salmon count from March to October, which is the time the spring and summer salmon are going through. And you can see from this that there's about 3,300 on average. And if those 3,300 represent 5% of the smolts that went out of the river, you can see that just under 70,000 smolts would have produced them. Now we know from research work that just under five smolt-sized fish per duck per day can be eaten. So 100 birds at this rate would eat around 14,300 smolts in a month, just under 30,000 in two months. Now that would equal just over 40% of the total smolt output of the ethic for just 100 gusanders. So in terms of rearing young, just six average-sized broods would require a weight of fish equal to the whole smolt output of the ettrick. So I think that shows that gusander predation does have the potential to damage stocks. So the next question, of course, is how many gusanders are there on Tweed? Well, we count from ettrick mouth to the sea four times a year. And the longest series we have is for April, and you can see it's around about 200 birds at that time. Now those represent, of course, the breeding population of the Tweed, or at least that part of the Tweed. The really big numbers are in October, when we have not only the young produced on the Tweed, 
but wintering birds from all over the British Isles and it would appear also from overseas. Now one of the issues we're wanting to investigate at the Foundation is the autumn migration of pars, it's called, when you get par that are going to smolt the following spring moving down the river in the autumn and therefore staying at the bottom of the river and the, uh, until they're ready to smolt in April and May. Now if that happens on a large scale it's actually taking a lot of the production of the tweed down into the lower river where the gusanders are accumulated over the winter. So as I say that is an issue of interest and concern that we are trying to follow up. With cormorants we find the numbers much fewer, around about 50 birds or so, but every now and again you get uh, eruptions of cormorants onto the river, as shown here. Now why such numbers should suddenly turn up on the river, uh, we don't know. It's not of course just birds that can eat smolts, we also find signs of fish predation. Uh, this is type 8 as we call it, U-shaped bite from below. It's pretty obviously a fish that's come up and grabbed hold of the smolt. Now we think this is more likely to be eel than trout because we have found this on par in hill burns where uh, eels would be the only fish of any size. So with all these problems and dangers, how many smolts actually get to the sea? And this is something we had no idea about until we took part in the Living North Seas programme a few years ago. And our main work in that was to acoustic tag smolts in the upper tweed and see how far they got, how many of them got to the sea. We actually use sea trout smolts for this because at 150 millimetres on average they're somewhat bigger than salmon smolts at 120 and so could carry the tags better. Now we caught them and released them on the Yarrow water at the fish farm there and we were aware that there is evidence from other places that inseam structures can be problems for downseam migrants as well as upstream. So we made sure that our automatic listening stations to track the smolts uh, covered such uh, inseam structures. In 2011 we actually released the smolts at two other sites as well, one of which was below the cold at Philip Hoch at the Etterick, because that appeared to be having major effects on smolt migration. Now the results of this varied greatly between the two years that we did it. In 2011 half of them got to sea but in 2010 only 20% got to the sea. And this must be due to the very different water levels there were in those two spring seasons. 2011 not only was there one very major spate, there were some smaller spates as well and a reasonable general water level. 2010, by contrast, was a drought year. Those little peaks that you can see are actually the freshets being released from the megat to keep the water levels up in the ca help keep the water levels up in the catchment. We also saw a huge difference in the delay created by the inseam structures. 2010, with low water, the delays at these obstructed zones was in days but in 2011 it was just in minutes. So an enormous difference made at those structures by the quantity of water. Now it appears that these in-stream structures are not actually physical barriers to the smokes getting downstream. Here's the Melrose called for instance. It's completely ruined and you can see from this picture that there's really nothing that's going to stop physically stop smolts getting down over it or adults getting back up over it either. What appears to be the trouble for the smolts is that long slow flowing flat water area upstream which is held back even though 
the cold itself is ruined. Now in these areas there isn't a strong current to keep the smolts moving downstream so they're slower, they're delayed and it would seem from our evidence that they're much easier for predators whether birds or big trout to get hold of. In fact it appears that these sorts of areas are restaurants for predators. And of course it's not just the Melrose cold that there is on the river, there is a whole chain of colds and other structures on the Tweed. So in fact you can think of the Tweed as a sort of chain of restaurants at which predators can dine easily and comfortably on smokes as they head out to sea. But of course uh, a lot of smokes do make it to the sea and it's always a great sight to watch them head out 